forgive. And you will be forgiven. This man? A king? Are you then the son of God? This is my body which is given for you. Let's do in remembrance of me. Forgive the Father. I don't know what they do. Remember me, Jesus. When you come as king, I promise you, today you will be in paradise. Into thy hands, I commit my spirit. What would you sacrifice for someone you love? Think about the people you love the most. And think, what what would I actually sacrifice for them? And and before we get too uh, grandiose and paint ourselves in the heroic picture of amazing sacrifice, let's be practical. How many people do you love enough that you would sacrifice picking them up at San Francisco airport when you had to leave at 11 o'clock at night and you know you wouldn't be home till 3.30 in the morning. I mean, how many people do you love that much? It's easy to think about sacrificing in generic terms. It's hard to think about sacrificing in smaller ways. How much would you sacrifice for someone you love? A person you love and care deeply about is critically ill. And they cannot pay the bills needed to be made well. How many people do you love enough to sacrifice to the point of selling everything you have? Young people, that means your phone. (laughs) It means your house. It means emptying your savings account. It means to, to help them get back to health. It means everything. How many people are on your list now? that you would sacrifice that much for? How many people do you love enough that you would die for them? See, see we're, we're quick to say, oh, I, I'd lay my life down. But if you wouldn't pick someone up at the airport in the middle of the night, you probably wouldn't die for them. We have to be honest. What would you sacrifice for those that you love? Now, let's take it a step deeper. What would you sacrifice for someone you don't know very well. They live down the hall in your apartment. They live across the street and down a couple houses in your neighborhood. And you don't really, you wave and say hi and bye, but you don't know them well. I mean, what would you sacrifice for them? You probably wouldn't be going at 11 at night to pick them up at the airport. Let's go one step deeper. What would you sacrifice for someone who hates you? You know they hate you because they've told you. They've shown it over and over again. They consider you their enemy. They have no love for you. They live in a way that shows they care nothing about you. What would you sacrifice for someone like that? In Romans chapter 5, there's this powerful passage that gives us a picture of the love of Jesus and the heart of God and the sacrifice of God for us. Because understand, when Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me, we were his enemies. We were not his friends. He may have loved us, but we did not love him. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. You see... At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, 
While we were rebels and God haters, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? I think sometimes when it comes to this time of the year, when we come to a Good Friday service and Easter service, we think about Jesus sort of in vague historical generalities. Ah, Jesus lived, he died, he rose, I know the story. But we have to be captured by the reality, just the absolute firm reality of what it is that we're remembering tonight and what it is that we will celebrate and remember on Sunday morning. We need to understand that, that Jesus really lived. He entered human history. He had real parents. God was his father. Joseph was kind of a stepfather. But Mary was his mother. He, he had real parents. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, pouring out his life for you and me and dying for us, Mary, his mother, was down at the foot of the cross. His mother watching her son, her firstborn, with life pouring out of him. And also near the foot of the cross was John, the beloved disciple. And, and it's, it's, it's important to, to hear the voice of Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, as he's gasping for air and for life, as he's dying for our sins. He looks at his mother and he says, woman, here is your son, indicating John. And then to John, he says, here is your mother. Roughly translated, what Jesus is saying is this. John, take care of my mom. Take care of her. Mom, John's going to look out for you. I'm not going to be there anymore. This is, this is, this is a, a real man. A real, Jesus was the son of man. He was human. He had a real mom, and he loved, and he cared about her. He had a real birth. He was, he was really born. We read these words in Luke chapter 2. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. They're in Bethlehem. It's time for Jesus to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Jesus was born like all people are born, except without anesthetics and without a hospital and without doctors and nurses. His mother Mary's water broke like every woman's water breaks when she's going to deliver a child. She went through contractions. And, and the God of the universe who came among us, Emmanuel, God with us, in this baby in her womb is pushed through the birth canal and breathes the air of our world. He felt the cold. He needed sustenance. This is God coming among us. He really lived. He was really born. It was a real incarnation. It was an inbreaking of God Almighty into our world and into our lives. A passage read early in the service paints this picture in Philippians chapter 2, talking about Jesus saying, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, saying that Jesus was utterly equal with the Father. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was fully God. But he did not grasp that and hold on to it for himself. He in some way beyond our comprehension emptied something of himself so he could come among us and be one of us. This was God enfleshed. Emmanuel, God with us. Hebrews 4.15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. This Jesus who really came among us, this Jesus who, who was God with us, he was so like us that he could actually die for us. He was so like us that he could experience what we would have experienced had we 
been put on a cross. So he felt the kind of things that we feel as we walk through life, including temptation. It's just that he never gave in. He never sinned. He was just like us, and yet he was entirely different. Entirely different, because he was the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He had real friends, and he had real enemies. The disciples, his friends, loved him. They were flaky sometimes, but they loved him. People in the religious community, mixed bag. A lot of them were jealous. A lot of them were angry. Some of them sought him out, talked with him late at night, tried to figure out this whole thing. Some loved him, some hated him. But these are real human relationships. And when someone hates you, it hurts. And Jesus felt that because he walked in a real relational world. The political gears of his day were turning and grinding and he kind of got caught in those gears. And they didn't really care. They just kind of kept pressing forward. This is Jesus, a real man. The crowds, man, the crowds, they loved Jesus. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, praise God in the highest. The crowds, crucify, kill him. Back and forth. You've been in a relational world where one moment someone loves you and the next moment it seems like they hate you. Jesus felt that. Because he walked as a real man in a real world. He was God, but he was God among us, Emmanuel. He had real joy and real pain. Jesus felt it all. He felt the heights of joy, laughter, relationships, friendships. He felt the cut of betrayal and abandonment and the anger of people against him? If you ever wonder, does Jesus understand me? Oh, he knows you. He walked in this world so that when he came to the cross, he could experience what we would have experienced had we not accepted him and taken his forgiveness and his work on the cross. Jesus was utterly like us, so like us that he could actually take our sin and take our shame. And yet, he was entirely different. He was the sinless Lamb of God who takes away all the sins of the world with all who will believe, with all who will receive, with all who will bow their knee to him. Don't think of Jesus in vague, hazy Oh yeah, I think he kind of lived. He was a real person in a real place with a real family and a real birth and real friends and real enemies. He understood life. He understands you and me. And he also suffered a real death. He really died. This is not some narrative invented by religious people. This is what happened to our Lord. And, and I know oftentimes when we talk about the death of Jesus on the cross, we focus on the physical, and that's part of the story. But there's more going on than just his physical suffering. We think of the cross, and, and when you understand that, that the Romans had worked for a long time to find a way to execute people that was slow, that was public, that was shameful, that was torturous. Uh, so the cross was horrible, but there was more going on than just the physical suffering. He understood real relational pain and abandonment. This one little line from Mark chapter 14 should, should just capture our hearts. In this moment of need, when Jesus was coming near the end, this is what we read in Mark 14, 50. Then everyone deserted him and fled. All those who said, Jesus, I'll be there for you. They might leave you, I won't. I'll never abandon you, Jesus. They all ran for the hills. And Jesus was left alone. You don't think a person who, who understands the fullness of humanity, you don't think someone feels that? Have you been abandoned by your friends? And here's what I know. Almost every person here has. You know what it feels like. And sometimes the scars that are left by abandonment, by somebody who said, I love you, I'll be there for you, I'll never leave you, and they abandon you, sometimes those scars hurt way more than a broken arm because a broken arm can be healed. 
And sometimes a heart takes a lot longer to heal. They all fled. The political powers just threw them aside. You feel that. The crowds screamed, crucify. You feel that. His best friends, the disciples fled. You feel that. One of his closest inner circle of friends sold him out for about the equivalent between $200 to $600 of today in today's world and time. For that small amount of money, one of his closest friends sold him out. Peter denied him. Peter, who was one of his closest friends on this earth. Yeah, I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the guy. I swear I don't know him. I don't know him. May I be cursed if I know him. I don't know the man. And Peter said all of that with Jesus in earshot and with eye contact. You feel that. This is part of what Jesus suffered as he went to the cross. He had real physical pain and agony. We began the service with Isaiah 53, 3 through 7. But he bore our sins. He took our shame and, and the, the stripes, the wounds that we deserved, he took upon himself. From the scourging to the walk up the hill, carrying the, the cross till he collapses, to the nails, to the public shaming, to the excruciating breathing, trying to find air, through all of that, that was part of what Jesus suffered for us. But I, I believe that even more as, as horrific and torturous as the emotional relational pain was, as horrible as the physical pain was, the greatest of all pains, infinitely more, was the spiritual pain he bore. Because he took our sins. He had real spiritual pain. And there was a cost in what Jesus was doing on that cross. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we read these words. This is a picture of when Jesus is hanging on the cross, bearing our sins, taking our shame. Peter writes, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself to the Father. He himself bore our sins. Hear those words. Jesus Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. On the cross. And, and, and I, I've been a pastor now for over three decades. I, I, I don't know how to put into words and to express what is happening in this moment on the cross. But as Jesus hung on the cross, every one of my sins that I ever have ever committed and ever will, and every one of your sins that you have ever committed or ever will, those sins were placed on Jesus. He bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. This is what Jesus is doing on the cross. He is taking our sins. He is taking our shame. He is taking our judgment. He is taking our punishment and all that we would have felt and experienced, the hell that we would have been due because of all those things was placed on Jesus. I, I, I don't know how to fully understand it or express it, but at this moment, the wrath and the judgment and the payment and the punishment that I deserved for, for, for my junior high, foul mouth, heartless tearing down of other people. He took it on himself. For my high school years of utter selfishness before I knew Jesus, living just for me, in my brokenness and in my mean-spiritedness, he took it all on himself. Every thoughtless word I've spoken to my wife and regretted the minute I said it, he took that on himself. Everything, every thought I shouldn't have thought, everything I've said that I regretted or that I was glad I said it because I hurt someone and my heart was so hard, I wasn't even sorry. He took it on himself and he took your sins too. He really died on the cross bearing our sins. This is not just some historic event. This is not just some story about self-sacrifice. 
This is Jesus Christ bearing our sins and bearing our shame. And then he really died. It was a real death. God who entered human history in the manger is now hanging on a cross. And he stops breathing. And his heart stops beating. And to make sure he's dead, they take a, they take a sword and they thrust it into his side. And all the signs of that death just come pouring out. And the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, died. He really died. Having paid the price, having finished the work. And they put him in a tomb. And they left him there to rot forever. And on Sunday, we'll be celebrating what happened next. But tonight... I want us to linger here. I want us to understand that Jesus was so like you. He became human. He was so like you that when he died on the cross, he could bear your sins. He could take your shame. He could take your punishment. He could take the physical, emotional, relational, spiritual suffering that you would have taken because he bore it on himself and he then offered it to you. And if you're his follower, if you've come to the cross and received him, it is yours and it belongs to you and you are his child. And if you haven't yet, he's waiting. He didn't die for nothing. He died for you. And then these beautiful words that Jesus himself spoke in John chapter 10 that puts it all in perspective. Jesus says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. People ask the question, who put Jesus on the cross? Was it, was it the Jews? Was it the Gentiles? Was it the political establishment, the religious establishment? Was it, was it me? Well, there's, there's guilt, enough guilt for everyone. But at the end of the day, Jesus went on the cross because he chose to. To bear your sins and to bear mine. He says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. What would you sacrifice for someone you love? What would you sacrifice for somebody you hardly know? Here's the real question. What would you sacrifice for someone who calls you their enemy and hates you? And the answer for most of us is not much. And yet Jesus chose to sacrifice everything for those who screamed, I am your enemy, by their lives, by their words, by their hearts. And he, through a sacrifice, has made us friends of the living God. This is good news, amen? Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray that as we prepare to come to the table, as we prepare to remember you, this gift that you have given to us, as we come to take in our hands the bread and remember your body broken, to take in our hands the cup and remember your blood shed, to come to the cross, to come to the table. Jesus, meet us in this time. We long to see your face. We long to be reminded of your love for us. But we also need to come to the cross again and to remember that it was for my sins, not the vague sins of humanity, for my sins that you died. And so meet us in this time as we seek your face. I want to give you four invitations as we continue to worship together. We have some places around the room just for you to kind of encounter Jesus, spend time with him. And there's kind of four different things you can do in this time. One is across the front, I invite you to come and just kneel at the kneeling area and just pray and talk to the Lord. There's also cards up here with pencils and they're here on the tables and the doors. There's kind of cards everywhere. If you want to come up here and just write a prayer or a confession or just, just a thanks to God for the gift of Jesus, whatever it is. And at the foot of all three of the crosses, there's just baskets. You can take that and fold it up and just place it there and just pray and, and thank Jesus or confess whatever's on your heart. Meet Jesus as you come here to pray, as you come to the crosses. Um, if you want to give something tonight, if your heart's moved to do that, 
at the tables on the sides of the room and back here, there's boxes. Everything that's given tonight will go into our food pantry. Uh, we'll use it to buy food. Sometimes we have to buy food, certain foods that we need. And so anything that goes in there, we will use this. We, we feed over 2,000 families a year through our church. And so if you're moved to give an offering, just understand you can put in those boxes that will all go to food for the hungry in our community. And also there's on those tables, there's a sheet that says, here's the main foods that we need that we run out of the most. Would you take one of those with you and put it on your refrigerator or just put it in your phone on your shopping list? And every time you go to the store and you shop for your family, buy two or three things that you don't need but somebody else does on that list and just bring them here. Maybe once a month, bring them and just bring them to the food pantry, drop them off there and we will get them to people who really need them. So you can respond by giving back if God stirs your heart. And then also, we invite you to come to the table. And we have two stations on this side of the worship center, and we have two stations over here, and then we have two stations in both areas here. So if you're in the balcony, you come down, you can go right to those stations and just receive the bread, receive the cup, and then when you're ready, you can partake of it. You can come up here and partake where you're in the front. You can go back to your seat and partake. But just when you're ready and you've spent some time with Jesus, partake of that. I invite you to listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 12 as you prepare to come and share at the table with Jesus. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When you come to the table, when you take the bread and the cup, I encourage you to take a moment just to search your heart. Is there anything you need to confess to Jesus? This is a good time to do it. Bring it to the foot of the cross. Confess it to him. Secret things, hidden things, things that maybe you weren't even aware of, but God puts on your heart tonight so that you can bring it and lay it down and turn away from it. As you come to the table, I encourage you to remember, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So remember the life of Jesus. Remember the death of Jesus. Remember what he's done in your life since you've come to the cross. Remember Jesus. And then also I want to encourage you that communion... Sometimes people look at it as, as just sort of me and Jesus. But this is a community sacrament that we celebrate together. So as you're upcoming to pray in the front or going to give an offering or going to one of the, the servers to receive communion, if you see someone you know and you love, say hi to them, give them a hug, give them a handshake, whatever is appropriate, and, and just connect with people. Because it's not just this me and Jesus. It's us together walking with Jesus. Lord Jesus, as we continue to worship, Meet us at the foot of the cross. Meet us as we kneel and pray and, and reflect and write praises, confessions, celebrations, heartache, whatever it is. Meet us as we give. Meet us as we share fellowship with your people. Jesus, meet us in this time as we come to encounter you, to remember you, to thank you for this gift of your life. Meet us in this time. When you're ready, come to the table, to the cross, to pray, however the Lord leads you.